Hello and welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the vlogcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. During this episode, I sit down for a chat with Lisa Coe, a mathematics specialist in Norfolk, who shares her experience of teaching and leading in the east of England, how time away from the classroom reframed her approach to teaching, and what must be a fraction of the mathematical expertise she has developed over many years. Whether you're new to teaching or a school leader with tons of experience, this interview is a must listen. And if you happen to be listening on your preferred podcast provider, don't miss out on the extended cut in which Lisa takes on the manipulative tier list, ranking some of her favourite mathematical manipulatives. Full interviews are available from the Thinking Deeply by Primary Mathematics YouTube channel or thinkingdeeply.info, where full show notes and references can be found. And without further ado, let's spend some time thinking deeply about primary education. We normally start the show in inverted commas and... Um, with our guests in numbers. So I've got some questions and you can only answer with numbers. Um, and the first one is years as a teacher. Six and a third. Number of schools? Two. Last year group taught? Four and five. Book reviews? 29. Uh, yes, I actually went back to the site the other night and was, I was impressed by how many there were. <laughs> <laughs> I did a quick count up. I'm sad that there's not 30. I, I'm not I'm not a fan of 29. I need to get another one in before Christmas, I think. I can, I can, I can think of one that could that could be done for. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's on my list. It's on the top of my pile. <laughs> <laughs> um, Favourite year group? Five. Most important year group? <sighs> One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Interesting answer. <laughs> um, I think if you're going to hold me to one, I, I've I... three and four. That's as that's as close as I can get. I'm with you there. And tweets. <laughs> Seventeen thousand three hundred. Wow. It, it, every time I ask someone, I'm like, oh, it's, they've got like tens, tens of thousands more than, I think I'm on like three or four thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it has been since since 2016. So that's, you know, it's it's a fair while. Um, but yeah, I looked this morning and I was a bit shocked at how many, how many there were. So yeah, lots awesome. of tweets. <laughs> that's impressive. Um, and so you're currently maths lead for a trust in Norfolk? Mm -hmm, yep. Tell us about your journey as a teacher um, and how you got there. So I describe this to lots of people as um, luck and fluke. Um, but actually, I think that, that there is a lot of hard work and a lot of effort that's gone into it. But I have been really lucky in some of the things that have happened. So um, I started off, um, obviously, as an NQT, um, I worked for six years in the same school. And while I was um, to get my NQT job, I had to do a maths problem solving lesson. And so when I got the job, the head teacher said to me, oh, you did a wonderful lesson. We'll, we'll put you in the maths team. So in my school, we had um, specific leads, but we also had then everyone had a role to play in developing a subject so we had teens and so on and I was a bit miffed because um I have an English degree um I'd really you know I was really passionate about grammar and reading and I was like okay fine but you do as you're told just then QT um and I grew to love it so I grew to love maths and the teaching of maths and the more my understanding grew you know the more the more passionate I got about it really um and then after six years I was in a comfortable rut in my school um didn't really know what I wanted to do wasn't sure if teaching in its kind of day-to-day -day fashion was was what I wanted to carry on doing um so I resigned um, with no job to go to which was you know the scariest thing um, I've ever done but luckily um I found the job advertisement for mathematics mastery which I know we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, later um and I got the job and spent four years there working um, as a maths lead and learning a huge amount from amazing people about maths and the pedagogy and 
all the bits and pieces. And I was really lucky. I got to go and work with well over 100 schools in those four years all across the country. You know, so I think I've seen I've, I've seen independent schools. I've seen schools with, you know, massive social deprivation and everywhere in between. And I've worked with schools from Kent to Northern Ireland, you know, and everywhere in between. So so that was a really nice experience. But again, after about three years, I was sort of getting getting a bit itchy feet. Um, the traveling was great, but hard um and and so um one of the two of the schools I worked with um were the inspiration trust schools which is where I am now and as part of that I met the director of maths um and he um was a secondary mathematician obviously they've got primary schools and so he approached me around this idea of having a primary person in their team and then he let me know when the job was interviewed, interviewing, and so I interviewed for it. And as of September, that's where I've been. So yeah, it's it's um it's been lucky in the sense that I've met the right people at the right time, I've seen the right adverts at the right time, and I've been lucky enough to be interviewed and get the jobs that I've been looking for. But I, I know that I've put a lot of work in in terms of developing my understanding. But yeah, I, I usually just go for luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, to be fair, I, I often say. Oh, I was quite fortunate, but actually then people who are sort of looking after me say, no, don't put yourself down. So I'm glad that you acknowledge that you do work very hard. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, I've learned a lot and I've, I've, I've applied myself a lot to thinking about thinking deeply about maths um, for a long time now. And so it is I know that it is my subject knowledge and my pedagogical knowledge and everything else that has set me up for these roles but equally I have just been very lucky in the people that I've met and and the opportunities that I've had that have meant that that I'm able to to do the job that I love now so yeah very lucky and it's really interesting you say about not initially wanting to get involved in maths but actually being totally overcome by it and (laughs) <laughs> what like, and I've had this conversation with people before. What do you what do you reckon it is about maths? Is it because it's so rich in pedagogy and um, it's sort of you know it's it's a part of culture as well to an extent. You know what what, what do you think it is about maths that absorbs people into it because they do go hundred percent in, don't they? I think I think partly because math, maths is everything and it's everywhere, and I think you know. Um, I liked the language side of English. So I did, um, in the last year of my degree, I did a whole paper about um, Mrs. Dalloway and the use of modal verbs, um, which ironically, first time I'd ever heard of a modal verb, and now obviously we do them in what, year five, year six. But anyway, um, but I think that in itself is more about pattern seeking. It's more about being able to generalize and look for rules and things like that. And so in a way that is that mathematical thinking. And so I think I've always been quite logically minded. Um, and I was really lucky before my PGCE, I went on a, um, a seven day intensive maths course. It was kind of an intervention for people who had only just scraped the maths um, test that we had to do to get into the PGCE. I had been fine with the maths test, but um, they invited me because I was moving um, to Manchester and they thought it'd be a nice opportunity to meet people. Um, But in that course, I just learned so much. You know, I learned about chunking as an option for division. And I learned that the procedures that I knew that made me able to do maths were not actually maths. They were just tricks and procedures. And I think the more you learn about the different ways of thinking about maths, the more obsessed you get about it. And then the more you kind of strive to, to find the perfect way of doing something, not that there ever is, I don't think. Um, But yeah, I think it's just that, that generalizing and that pattern seeking and that, that excitement. I get excited by maths these days and I'm not afraid to admit, I'm not ashamed to admit that. <laughs> no, definitely. <laughs> you shouldn't be either. And um, yeah, I, I can see that because I'm quite interested in language and, you know, through the stuff we've done on storytelling, looking at where language came from. And mm. I think there, there, there definitely are a lot of similarities in how, um, how things behave with each other and stuff and the relationships. That yeah. I think it's the enthusiasm that you get from the the maths world and we're quite a small world um so particularly here we um there's a lady I work with who's part of the hub the maths hub here who I used to work with because she was a maths lead in one of the schools I taught and you know there's various other connections with people and you realize that actually the maths community particularly primary maths is small but wonderful 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I think we're a great bunch. Yeah, I agree. Um, and so one of, one of the reasons for these sort of interviews is to sort of explore teaching and learning. Um, what, what are the four most prominent um, sort of parts or features of a Lisa lesson? I like, I like a Lisa lesson. Um, I think it's really evolved um, over time. Um, and I think there are things that I do in lots of different ways. So I know perhaps some people will respond to this with like, set sort of structures or patterns whereas mine is more themes I suppose so the first one being language um I think it's vital that the children know and understand the language that we use in mathematics you know you need to be able to speak like a mathematician so language is a really important feature of my all my lessons uh, whether that be introducing them to the the vocabulary whether that be doing lots of I say you say type modeling whether that be you know actually literally teaching them those words like you would in a, a grammar lesson you know really diving into the etymology and so on um, and so language is is something that I have very high expectations with I'm constantly reinforcing and correcting the children and, and thinking about how how we can best introduce that so language is one of the key threads I suppose running through all of my lessons um the second one um would be making connections so um Mike Askew who I'm actually going to mention later on um talks about the importance of being a connectionist teacher in maths and that when I when I read that and when I sort of really thought about that, it really struck a chord with me because maths is completely interconnected and I'm still learning ways in which it's connected. And so I am constantly reinforcing connections in my lessons. So that might be to, oh, look at what we did yesterday. It might be to, oh, isn't this similar or different to what we did whenever um and also thinking about how I can connect forward as well. So I might say to the children, you know, not just remember this because it's important, but everything's important. But, um, but that idea of, you know, just kind of keep this in mind and I will make a note of it so that I can return to it in, in the future. Um, and so I think making making this connection is really explicit to the children is very important. Um, the third theme is uh, representation. So representations, um, it's been really hard in the in the COVID life to use manipulatives, um, but we have, we've done what we can. Um, so all of my lessons will have representations of some kind in them, whether that be pictures or whether that be concrete stuff. Um, thinking about how to expose those children to the underlying relationships and underlying concepts um, through those representations. So if I don't have a representation in my lesson, something's gone, gone very wrong. Um, and then I think the final sort of theme is um, reasoning. So this has kind of come from the sort of mathematical thinking, understanding that I've done a lot of working with Mass Mastery um, and something that I don't see a lot of in classrooms having been to so many of them. So I try really hard to ensure that there is that mathematical thinking opportunities um, and reasoning opportunities. And that crops up in so many different ways. So it might be through using variation. It might be through the questions that I ask or the expectations on children to say, well, why? You know, it might be as simple as, well, what do you notice? That kind of thing. But I make sure that all of my lessons just have that element in it. And it's not just me telling them. It's about them thinking about those connections and making those links themselves. So, yeah, rather than specific parts, I have themes, I think. Yeah, no, and um, yeah, there's no, um, I have no design in mind for um, the answer to the question. Um, and I think, you know, I could definitely get on board with all of those as, as fundamental. Um, so when you're talking about um, the connections, what would your advice be to anybody who's not 100% sure about those connections? Like, where would they go <laughs> for inspiration? Um, that's a tricky one. I think there are a lot of um, books and so on that will support that. I think the new NCTM Ready to Progress document is pretty good for that as well. So... Um, obviously we've got that new non-stack guidance that has literally it has making connections written in it but it also allows you to see that kind of snapshot of those key things and allows you to make those links 
Um, but I also think it's about exploring for yourself. So it's also about noticing yourself, doing the maths yourself. And I know that must be, you know, I've had the luxury of time to be able to do that. And as a full time class teacher, probably won't have happened. But being open to, to thinking about things and also Twitter. I mean, I've learned so much um, from Twitter, particularly early years stuff, because that's my sort of less known area. Um, you know, being able to read blogs and so on and so forth has, has opened my eyes to the possibilities of connections. So I think lots of different ways. Um, I think as a teacher starting out, asking asking people as well, you know, asking your maths lead, um, getting involved with maths comps and things like that and just having time set aside for once you've asked those questions to actually think about it which I know could be really hard to find yeah yeah so what they need is their sort of mentors giving them the time to think about it and stuff don't they yeah absolutely yeah yeah and that can be re- I mean it's so tricky you know I, I can quite happily sit here and say oh yes you know spend an hour a week thinking about maths but actually you know, when you've got all the other things you have to think about as a teacher, spending it, finding an hour a week can be really challenging, yeah. you know. So it's it's hard. But I think if you want to enable those connections, and I think they're really important, then I think that you do need to invest a bit of time. Because you only need to do it once, really, in a sense. You know, you only need to think about how uh, area models are linked to that kind of bus stop division thing you know that kind of having one like a horizontal and vertical line and that linking to an area model you only have to think about that once and then it's there forever um and then you can link it to other things but I think it's it is worth investing the time I think yeah yeah definitely you know they're all great great I think that's great advice and um, and then just teaching in as many year groups as well not, a, not necessarily in, in one big go but you know a couple of years in three a couple of years in four and those things sort of start to reveal themselves. Um, I, I took some of our TAs through GCSE a couple of years ago. Um, oh, wow. And in teaching them GCSE, I could see, oh, my goodness, that thing from year four, that thing from year five, it, it all started to tie up. And, and then, you know, you think about forward facing and stuff. And, and yeah, so I think just more experience, you know, which is easy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think being able to converse with secondary colleagues can be really useful as well actually you know maths mastery had a secondary arm um and although I never worked directly with the secondary team when they were looking at rewriting year seven year eight materials of course as primary people were were useful for for thinking about how how those kind of key themes and ideas work their way through the curriculum um, and in terms of school leadership, how do you try, because that's part, a big part of your role as well, isn't it? Um, how do you try and instigate change on a school-wide level? Um, so uh, thinking about the current role, um, obviously it's only been since September. I feel like I've been there forever. But um, So I think at the moment it's about um, building good relationships with people. So um, I am lucky in that the five maths leads of the five primary schools are all awesome. Uh, they're very uh, knowledgeable, um, you know, willing to, to learn and reflect. Um, but it's really important for me if I want them to develop their, the maths teaching across their schools, I need to have buy-in from them and their principals. And so I think building really good relationships is, is key. Um, and that was the same with, with Mathematics Mastery as well. You know, if, if the, the school leads in school and the head teachers liked and respected me, then it made a massive difference in terms of how I could kind of persuade them to, to develop the the areas that we were thinking about um and I think as well it's it's I've learned so far in this new role we've we've had a lot of there are things that need to change there are lots of things that need to change um in the primary schools to develop maths teaching um and I think I've learned already that you know that need that's going to happen that's going to take time and so it's about careful prioritization and thinking about okay what can we do and what is the time frame because teachers need to be able to sit with things you know they need to be able to if I introduce variation theory and a new curriculum and this and that and all the stuff in one go then they can't spin all those plates so careful thinking about okay 
this is what needs to change. What's our end goal? And therefore, what we can, what can we put in and when so that teachers have time to let it sit and simmer with themselves before launching into something else? Yeah, having that plan. You know, what, what can we change? What do we, you know, what do we get the most benefit from addressing first and then and then building on it yeah um, yeah yeah so for me at the moment it's um we're developing the curriculum so they the trust has a trust curriculum um and one of the first things I did was actually review it and I discovered that actually there were there were some really amazing things in there and there's some really lovely sequencing and progression but actually there were some things that were missing you know and, and there were some ideas and concepts that just weren't in that meant that in my opinion some of the children who were getting up to year five and year six are kind of missing some of those important aspects and so job number one really is for me that you know if you want the maths teaching in schools to be brilliant then what they're teaching from needs to be as good as it can be and so at the moment we're working on developing the curriculum so that it's fit more fit for purpose I suppose. And so you say we, does that mean you've got a team of you? So tell, tell me about that process. That's really important. No, no. <laughs> um, so so um, the trust, um, the way the trust works, and I don't know really if this is how all trusts work, but with, with our trust, we have um, a, we have central teams. So we have central subject teams. Um, so we have an English team, maths team, and so on and so forth. And the maths team has existed for a while, but they, um, in fact, the whole, across the whole trust, it has primarily had secondary practitioners in, which is obviously amazing in terms of subject and pedagogical knowledge. And actually the wider curriculum stuff is phenomenal for that. It's got so much depth of knowledge and it's, it's brilliant. But the problem with the maths curriculum is that while the knowledge is there, the actual how to put that into practice at a primary level was was kind of missing. So I am currently the only member of the central subject team who is primary practitioner. So it's kind of me. (laughs) But I have obviously, as I mentioned, I've got the five maths leads in school who, while they still obviously teach day to day and everything else, um, they're often my sounding board. Um, So at the moment, we're at the point where I have organised all the objectives in each year group into what I think would be a sensible order. And I've sent it out to them and it's their job now to to critique and everything else. And because I have built up that relationship with those those people, it means that if I am you know, going off the deep end and if I have made very strange choices, they are in a position where they can challenge me and they will challenge me. So it's um, so although it is me, I'm a kind of I feel like a team of one sometimes. Um, my secondary colleagues are amazing because they will listen. Um, but it's sometimes tricky when I'm sort of talking about particularly lower end of the school and um, their kind of understanding of how maths is taught is a bit limited. Yeah, I get you. That sounds fascinating, though, because I'd love to do that. But I think my my office would end up, you know, with like um, paper all over the walls and string come from different bits. And stuff. How it looks at the moment, I have <laughs> I have massive bits of flip chart paper with um with the the original concept maps in the middle, and then like my no string yet, but lots of different colours. Um, and then I've got other bits of paper with the ready to progress statements on. Yeah, my my love. I have a lovely office, which is um, I'm very lucky to to have an office in the school I work in. And it is yeah, progressively getting more wallpapered. It's brilliant. I love it. Um, but if I get a string, I might have to worry. <laughs> yeah, as we know, you've gone off completely off the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send help. <laughs> so. As we've, we've sort of covered a little bit before, um, you've spent a few years working for math, Mathematics Mastery, um, mm-hmm, yeah. an education company specialising in mathematics. Um, I'd be really interested to know, what did you learn and would you recommend it to others? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I learned a huge amount in lots of different areas. I think primarily for me, I learned about different schools. So having taught in the same school for six years, it's in Norfolk, you know, it's a lovely school. Um, But we had, you know, uh, a quite uh, homogenous group of homogenous cohorts. So I had never really experienced EAL pupils, Um, you know, I mean, obviously I have met EAL pupils, um, but never in the sense that, you know, I've I've, I've now worked with schools who had, you know, 97% EAL and who speak 30 different languages. And I'd never encountered anything like that before. Um, 
I also have met a huge range of SEND pupils. And so I've had to think and tailor to a huge, more and more range of pupils than I would ever encountered in my in my career teaching. Um, I've also met a diverse range of teachers. So I've I've worked with teachers who are unqualified. I've worked with teachers who have 30 years of experience and are a bit stuck in their ways and more resistant to change, um, you know, and everywhere in between. So I think from that respect, it's a great way of seeing a massive range of schools all across the country, you know, and it's, I've, the schools in Northern Ireland were a particular eye opener because um, (laughs) silly things like they don't get PPA. And I was like, how, how do you do all of, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. You sort of realise that you realise how lucky you are to have just that time um, because a lot of the schools in Northern Ireland didn't get that. It was it was interesting from silly points of view as well because um, they say the word square differently. <laughs> um, and so when I was talking to the children about shapes, they had no idea what I was talking about because I said square and I'm not even going to attempt <laughs> the accent, but it's much sort of smaller in the mouth, I suppose you'd say. And so it's very... Um, so there was some language barriers, which are always interesting, uh, <laughs> considering we were all speaking the same language. But the um, vowels, are, vowels are very different, because um, even when, when I say ship, it sounds like ship, and um, so I have to really enunciate whenever <laughs> I'm talking to kids over here. But <laughs> well, any words with vowels in them are lots of. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have that issue because I say graph rather than graph. And my Norfolk lovely children now are all saying graph and it makes me so happy. <laughs> um, but I think so. So in that respect, I think it was it was one of the best things I ever did. Um, and in terms of my subject knowledge as well, you know, um, it has meant, I think, and I don't know because I haven't tried, but I think if I ever wanted to be a, a, a regular classroom primary teacher, as in teaching all the subjects, I think that that might be more of a challenge for me because I'm now five years in near enough where I haven't taught anything except maths. Um, but what I do know is that I've been able to spend all this time just thinking about maths, you know, we're in, in maths mastery, we could spend six hours just talking about one tiny aspect of mathematics. Um, I got to write uh, an entire scheme of work essentially for year six you know I got to write 100 lessons for year six and plan it all and resource it all and sequence it all and and so those experiences I think I would never have got any other way and I don't think I would be in the job I'm in now if it wasn't for that experience um, and so and for me it reinvigorated my want to teach I think I said earlier right I got to the point after six years where I wasn't sure that teaching was for me um and now I absolutely love my job again and you know and I think it took those four years out where I was teaching adults essentially and and advising to make me realize that this is what I'm I'm passionate about this is what I'm good at and actually now I'm teaching just maths and then spending the rest of my day thinking about a curriculum it's just brilliant so I think you asked me if I'd recommend it I think I think yes and no I think If you know in yourself that actually what you want to do is do something specialised, then I think working for an organisation that specialises in an area can can only be a good thing. Because what I've learned is I don't think I'd have learned it any other way. Even going through the NCTM or anything like that, I don't think I'd have the knowledge that I do. Um, However, I think if you do have, you know, if you want to be go into SLT in a primary school or do anything that requires you to have a really good knowledge of all the different subjects, then perhaps this isn't the the, the path for you because, you know, it's, it's, I, I happily admit that my geography, the geography knowledge is not good enough to teach primary geography anymore, you know, and that's, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think so. It, it depends on what you want to do with your life, I think. Yeah, uh, I think that the bar's definitely been raised in terms of what teachers are expected to know in terms of the, oh, the wider curriculum. And um, like, I'm absolutely. not even sure where Surrey and Sussex are. I know they're still, they're around about Kent, but I thought the whole <laughs> thing was Kent for a long time. So you know, my job. Yeah. <laughs> I I have a whole grey area. So like, um, I know the bottom of the country and I know where London is, but there's a whole like band across between like below London and above like you know Portsmouth, <laughs> Bognor Regis, Devon, Cornwall. I have no idea what happens there. Not a clue. <laughs> 
Um, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> Yeah. North of England, I'm fine. Um, but yeah, and I just think, you know, teachers are required to know so much. We are, primary teachers are expected to be experts in every single subject. And if you can find a person like like me or like yourself, Kieran, who has got that, you know, deep knowledge of, of one subject and you can get them in your school or in your trust or whatever, it can just make such a difference for maths teachers, like for primary teachers, sorry, because if I can help them out with these connections and with this language and with great ways to teach maths, it just means that they can, they still have to think about it, but they can concentrate developing their subject knowledge on, I don't know, yeah, where where these strange places that aren't Kent are or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'd love us to adopt a, a specialist model, um, you know, because I've seen it work in other other countries and you know mm-hmm. maybe teach two or three subjects they teach maths and and two of the sciences perhaps you know and because i think you probably get a lot more people coming into teaching because they're they're teaching solely about what they're passionate about but then but yeah you know, you know who am i to dictate mm-hmm. government policy at the minute we'll see one day I, I worked with an academy chain in london who did exactly that and it meant that they could teach a wider range of like um, the wider curriculum so they had someone who had specialized in latin and so they were teaching the kids latin and they had someone else who was doing like had done like ancient history as a degree and so they were doing that and it was just it was fabulous and, and you know i know it wouldn't necessarily work for everybody and you would have to have teachers that you know we couldn't all apply, apply to your school because we're all good at maths <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah i think there is there is power in allowing the freedom to teach in that way um particularly in key stage two um having that balance between the teach like you're not having 17 different teachers or whatever it might be so they've got that continuity in terms of they're seeing the same adult regularly but having specialisms is is i think can only be a good thing yeah maybe one day you never know um, who knows we'll change the world kieran we'll uh <laughs> <laughs> and- so at the minute you are leading maths across several schools. Tell me what, or tell me about the pros and cons of such a role. Um, I think I've talked a bit about the the pros sort of generally, but I think um, for me it's it's a just being able to teach maths. Um, so I teach maths currently in one of the schools. Um, and four mornings a week and that's with two year groups who have been identified as being a bit more challenging in terms of their subject knowledge so I've been working really hard to develop those um and that's just it's just wonderful I love going in and teaching you know and I've still gotten to know them I've still built those relationships um but it's just meant that I can focus on that and then swan off and do other things um and I think the pros as well is like although the inspiration trust is obviously um it's a trust all the schools are very different so they have some commonalities but they're very individual and I love that and I love being able to think carefully about you know the the positives that are coming out of all the different schools and how individual they are and that's just brilliant I think the biggest con is um (laughs) has been noticed in the last few weeks really as I have gotten to know the schools more um there's only obviously there are only five so it's not not a huge number of schools but um there are certainly four of them who could really do with me regularly so could really do with my time regularly and so the biggest challenge I think is is not having multiple me's um there is only one of me and so I want to go and spend time in all of the schools and I I can't I just physically there, there isn't enough hours in the day they're not massively geographically distanced um so they're sort of within driving distance um but it is a real challenge I think to be able to to do that and also with obviously the the current pandemic situation it's not easy for me to get into schools because I teach two classes it's then well I can't start bursting bubbles and and everything else you know I could be responsible for sending the entire trust home (laughs) (laughs) it hopefully will be a bit easier after Christmas but yeah I mean next week for example I've got three different conversations with three different schools and I'm pretty sure they're all going to say to me we need some of your time and I've then got to try and work out how to do that and I'm going to disappoint somebody because because I can't physically be everywhere um so I think that's the biggest the biggest con um is just having I want I want to be able to do everything all at the same time but I've always been like that and and I can't 
And so accepting that I can't has been challenging. Yeah, no, I can relate to that. And even if I don't spend two days in the school, I'll feel like I'm starting to forget what it was like there. Um, and so yeah. I want to go back and stuff. Um, yeah. And also one of the schools, you know, one of the schools is less priority to the trust because they're, they're in, I say they're a new school, they're relatively new. So they don't yet have year six pupils. And obviously, you know, data for some people is very important. And so they're sort of, and they're, they're very, um, they're sort of leafy suburbs, you know, they're kind of the school that if you're going to rank schools on ones you need to worry about they'd be lower in the list but at the same time I don't want them to feel like I'm forgetting about them or that they're not important to me you know I want them to feel that I do care about them but at the same time there are schools that really need my support for lots of different reasons but um they don't in terms of you know the need but I don't want to forget about them either so it's that Again, it's it's a huge balancing act, and I think I'll feel guilty whatever I do, and I'm sure you do as well. You kind of feel guilty if you don't support a particular teacher or whatever it might be. Yeah, I, I really like the sound of your trust and the fact that then all the schools are different, you know, because that's that's one of the. I think that's really important because you know I've got two schools that are less than a mile away from each other, and they couldn't be more different in terms of how they see maths. And if I were to just say, right, plonk, here's here's the way we're doing it. It, it totally wouldn't work um you know whereas and um, yeah so th- 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 I really like the sound of that um yeah it's it's interesting I think um the inspiration trust as a trust um has a, a cloudy reputation in some respects I think you know that the it's one of those things where often decisions that have been made are negatively represented in the press you know you don't necessarily hear about all the wonderful things that happen and actually they are as a trust what I really like about them is they are completely committed to developing children in Norfolk you know and as a Norfolk girl myself I was born in Kings Lane you know I the the the, the county as a whole and I'm I mean, massively broad, broad strokes but you know, we have a lot of seasonal workers. We have a lot of low aspirations. We have a lot of um, just lack of. We have a lot of people, a lot of families who have been there for generations. You know, and I'm not saying Norfolk's any different to lots and lots of other places in the country. But what I like about the trust is the fact that they are really committed to to giving kids the knowledge and the opportunities to to change that if they want to, you know. And for me, that's really powerful. I was given the opportunity to interview for a Cambridge university when I was in sixth form. Didn't get in, not bothered about that. But the fact that I had that opportunity was, was just phenomenal. And actually being able to to give these children the opportunity to to learn maths in a way that is useful and just yeah <laughs> it's just it's just a really wonderful thing so i think that you know the trust is is doing brilliant things um and i'm really glad that they're they're focusing on their primary schools now and allowing us to to shine in our own ways as well so reading is clearly a passion of yours um, how did you get into edgy books in particular? Um, I'd like to say it wasn't, but it was it was Craig Barton's book. Um, so Craig Barton's How I Wish I Taught Maths. Um, it was it was doing the rounds in the Maths Mastery office, um, and I thought I'd have a read. So I was aware of him and his podcast, um, and so I thought I'd read it. And what I liked about it was how accessible it was and it made me realize that um and I think I'll loop back to this point because I know we're going to talk about research as well it made me realize that not all educational books were inaccessible um and that you could take things from it and so basically I read his book and made a list of all the other books that I wanted to read and then I read uh Willingham's uh, Why Don't Students Like School I read um neuroscience books and you know those kind of things as well and then it just kind of spiraled from there and after I read Craig's book um I mean it's a big old book and it you know there's a lot of words in there um, <laughs> I thought to myself well actually I've, I've read this and I've taken a lot away from it why don't I tell people about it um and so the blog was born um and then again I've been I've been lucky in the sense that 
some people, um, including yourself, have sent me um, some lovely books to read. Um, a couple of publishers have been very generous with their kind of copies as well. Um, and it's just grown from there, really. Um, so I've I've read a lot of books on a range of subjects, predominantly maths, because obviously I'm a maths person. Um, but that, that Craig Barton's was, was the start of it all, really. Um, and he has opened my eye. And then obviously I read his other book and that led to more books and so on and so forth. Nice. I think the, the field's definitely changed over the last 10 years. Um, like you say, more books that are easily digested, you know, on while teaching full-time in the classroom. And, and taking things that are really pretty complex and making them accessible is, is really important so yeah I, I think there's, there's definitely a place for the academic terms but then mm-hmm. sometimes you just need something that's going to help you with your teaching and learning you know because yeah and um, yeah because I've got like we've tried to collect a CPD library and then we can just point teachers towards chapters that that'll help them you know alongside modeling and stuff like that there so that's cool yeah and then, yeah, and it's, it's a really good situation. We've got publishers sent you books that you would have bought anywhere. But <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I make the point of, of I don't tend to read a book that like, say, I wouldn't read normally. Um, and I also, um, I try to accept the fact that although I don't necessarily get something from a book, that doesn't mean no one else will. So when I review books, I do try and stay as positive as I can because I accept the fact that although there's been two in particular that I just really didn't enjoy didn't get anything out of that doesn't mean that nobody will um and if I'm reviewing it I need to bear that in mind so I try and I try and be nice um about things yeah and yeah I suppose that's fair enough and I think um when you get to a certain level of expertise you you, you do have to keep in mind that not everybody has had the luxury of our experiences and stuff you know so, so absolutely how, yeah. how would I have seen that when I was and a novice yeah because because sometimes I feel like I'm reading the same thing you know for the hundredth time and then but I actually <laughs> know I've had the luxury of going to different conferences and, and, and doing yeah. That. yeah so uh, that makes total sense and um, and so research you mentioned it briefly and um, one of the things I like to ask people to do is talk about their research Thunderbolt which is um the paper that stopped the world and uh, the scales fall, you know fell from your eyes um, and you realize that um you know research informed practice was something that you you know that you had to get involved in um so for me it's not one particular paper but it's it's people so I hope that's okay um if not tough <laughs> <laughs> so um when I, what what I was thinking a lot about this actually and um when I did obviously did an English degree and then I did a PGCE and I am sure that I read research papers during both of those things I'm sure that must have happened I can't remember a single one of them um, and then I went through my career of teaching and didn't really read any educational papers. Um, and then I joined Mathematics Mastery, where it's kind of expected that you read stuff. Um, and so the people that did this Thunderbolt for me were um, Mike Askew, Anne Watson, John Mason, and Dave Hewitt. So Dave Hewitt... Um, was the first one really only because I came across his paper first on arbitrary and necessary uh, information in maths and the reason they're all my thunderbolts is because all of them write research write educationally informed pieces that are in English that I can understand you know I've I've read stuff and um, I was made to read during my time in mathematics mastery um a piece by um I think his first name's Raymond it's Duval anyway it's all about representation and genuinely it gave me a headache it took me like five hours to read it it gave me a headache I had to look up every fifth word and it's just not accessible you know and actually you know if you read Watson and Mason stuff particularly on variation theory it just makes sense. And so it was that realisation that I could read research and understand it. It was things that I could read and understand and things that I could make sense of um, and things that I could then apply immediately. Like Duval's piece, don't get me wrong, it has changed the way I think about things. But it's taken me... I mean, I read it probably two years ago and I'm now thinking about it now and thinking, oh, yeah, OK, I can do that. Whereas, uh, you know, Askew, Hewitt, Watson, Mason, just, it makes sense. 
and I can do stuff with it. And they've cut through all this fancy language, you know, and there is a place for long words, don't get me wrong, but I'm an English graduate and I still didn't understand some of the things that people were talking about. And I think it puts you off. And so for me, the thunderbolt was realising that the academics who I respect and academics who know their stuff can also write in a way that is accessible to, you know, again, thinking about teachers, like you said, like novice teachers who don't necessarily know what subitizing means or what a subtrahend is. They can still write stuff that, that those teachers can understand. And that for me is my thunderbolt. The fact that it's not all doom and gloom and long words. Nice. Yeah, that, that, that's a fantastic answer. Um, and uh, yeah, you'd be hard pressed to find a better and more influential list um, than, than the one you just gave it. Honestly, I mean, Duval's work is, is fascinating. It's, you know, it's all about making connections between representations, essentially. And it's, it's, he, he basically says that you can't understand any aspects of maths without representing it. Um, which isn't that's not the ground groundbreaking particularly I mean we all kind of know that but then he talks about um, conversions and treatments so the idea that you can if you're really skilled in thinking about representation like different numbers for example in different representations then you become really skilled at manipulating those and therefore you become very skilled at calculating with things and that I mean I am completely like ruining the nuances of what he says but and it's, it's, you know, it's very wonderful, but I, that I, there were words there that I just, it just gave me a headache and I had to read sentences several times to understand what, what was going on. And I think that, you know, I'm not knocking people who write in that way because actually that's fine. But I think for primary practitioners in particular, we need things like you say, we're time poor. We need things that we can access and understand without having to plow through it and, you know, get our teeth into it too much. Yeah. Have you checked out, do the Charter College do like little, I suppose, no, Cambridge Cambridge Maths is, is the better example. They do their espressos. Yes. Um, yeah, I love those them. Those are fantastic. I think they had one on the crocodiles, um, which is quite timely. <laughs> maybe, or no, or maybe it was the equality symbol. Um, but obviously it was that big conversation on there. Uh, on equivalence <laughs> yes yeah it was on the yeah i've seen that on twitter recently the equality the the that is equal to symbol and whether you should be saying equals or is equal to and all that kind of thing and i think that's it you know the 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 equal sign or whatever you want to call it is something that we spent at mass mastery we were debated for forever you know and we could spend hours and hours and hours on it actually primary teachers in the classroom don't have hours and hours and hours to debate it they need something like espresso that just tells them what what the best ideas are. What what is best practice? That's yeah. what we need. Nice. And so hopefully we'll be able to get you to stick to a paper on this one. And um, <laughs> is there a paper that you think every primary teacher simply must read? It doesn't have to be mathematics based. It can be anything. It is math. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's math based. Um, so for me, it's um, Anne Watson's Variation Unplugged. The reason being is that in my travels across schools, um, variation has been a word that has come up more and more and more, certainly in the last four or five years, I would say, um, certainly in primary. Um, and the problem with it, like mastery, like conceptual understanding like a million and one of the words is that it's been really really misunderstood and you know for me variation and setting tasks whether you want to call that purposeful practice or whether you want to call it whatever you want to call it there are so many different names these days as well actually the, the, the fundamentals behind variation are something I think that can be incredibly powerful for all teachers I think that used properly, it can inspire mathematical thinking and reasoning. I think it can challenge your higher attainers while allowing slower grasping children lots and lots of practice. It can encourage pattern seeking, generalization. It can do all of these amazing things. And yet it is so misunderstood. Um, 
And so, or, or misused, or someone finds a great variation task and just throws it at children without any thought. And so for me, Variation Unplugged really thinks about the fundamentals of what variation is. So you could go away and read the, the other papers, you know, by um, by those people that kind of coined variation. But actually, Anne Watson, again, just cuts through all the the nonsense and she talks about the fact that yes we can have you know conceptual variation and we can have procedural variation and we can have fusion and all these other weird and wonderful terms but actually what we're talking about is the changing one thing you know the variation and an invariant background and I think it was the that paper I'd read a huge amount on variation beforehand because it was something that we were developing in mass mastery and then I read that and for me, it just turned everything. It just it it it's almost my thunderbolt, but not my thunderbolt because it couldn't be both. <laughs> it just made sense to me, and it just helped me understand. And again, it was something. And the reason I think all primary school teachers should read it is because I think the implications of variation can be really far-reaching. It can be used in other subjects. It's not just a maths thing, and it's something that it's relatively short, which is always nice. Um, it is written in relatively easy to understand lexicon so it's not something that you have to have a dictionary next to you and I just think that it allows you to see that often what you think you're doing is variation or what you're being sold as variation is not variation and so therefore it can allow you to think about what it actually is and what it actually means and so for me I think everyone should read it. Yeah no I think um, Anne writes in the way that like you say engages and makes things make a whole lot of sense and in 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 my experience i think variation is almost too young a field and it's still trying to define itself you know you've almost got different different sort of factions discussing what it means to them and i think you know teachers need to sort of start taking you know what does it what what might it look like you know what do those principles look like in practice and and that should be our focus you know because then we won't have worksheets with variation written on them when there's little to no variation in them um but what we yes, will have yeah. is, you know because i think um think like obviously you know I'm, I'm almost a cliche or a party of myself but you know thinking about um what think about those principles when you're designing a task is almost more important than if you do it correctly or not i think you know because over time you're going to get a more refined process you know mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah i'm totally with you and i think i agree and i think reading chris mcgrain's book mathematical task book is is that kind of similar idea you know there's that and then obviously you've got reflect check whatever it's called by uh, craig barton i can never remember the order it goes in um and you know all of those things i think point towards the the power of variation but i think if you don't fundamentally understand what actually the purpose of it is then like you say, you end up just calling it variation and it's not. And I've seen I've seen things that are in, in the trust um, stuff that's called intelligent variation and there's nothing intelligent or varied about it. And so it's that misunderstanding. And I think that if you then read Anne Watson's paper, you can understand what you, what you mean by it and you can actually then look at it more critically and go, well, is it that? And if it's not that, don't call it that. And then work out, like you say, work out what it is for you and what it means for you. Nice. Excellent. It's been really interesting uh, talking to you about all things maths and, and education. Um, thank you very much for your time. It's been awesome. It's been a pleasure. It's really nice to, it's nice to have the opportunity to talk about primary maths. I think, um, you know, obviously there's lots of secondary podcasty type things around and it's nice to have a primary version celebrating our wonderful community. And there we have it. A truly fascinating chat full of superb insights into the world of primary education. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, follow or leave a review, depending on where you're listening. And if you have any questions for any of my guests, head over to the Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics YouTube channel and leave a comment and let the conversation continue long into the night. Until next time, thanks for listening.